All right, so uh, good evening and, and thank you for coming. Um, so first what I'd like to do is uh, introduce our panelists. Then I'm gonna make some very brief uh, opening remarks that uh, will set the topic up for us, I hope. And then we'll have uh, about an hour of panel discussion about, uh, about this issue and that will leave us plenty of time for questions as well. Um, so uh, can, can you all, can you see our two panelists on the screen? Can the two panelists hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, and you can see Satya. Excellent. And I can see you guys even though you can't see me. Uh, okay. Great. So uh, John Broom, would you like to wave? We have uh, John Broom. Thank you. Uh, John Broom is Emeritus White's Professor of Moral Philosophy at the University of Oxford and Emeritus Fellow of Corpus Christi College at Cambridge. I was on his website earlier today and I, I, I counted over 100 academic uh, articles on theories of reason and rationality and numerous other topics at the intersection of philosophy, ethics, and economics. Uh, his major books are Weighing Goods, Equality, Uncertainty, and Time, uh, 1992, Counting the Cost of Global Warming, very early uh, analysis of the, the philosophy of climate ethics. Uh, ethics out of economics, weighing lives and rationality through reasoning. He's also published a really great accessible book that I've used for classes called Climate Matters, Ethics in a Warming World. It's a very good uh, intro book for, the, for climate ethics. And finally, he was a lead author of a number of chapters and reports of Working Group 3 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So thank you for being here, uh, John. We also have Richard. Well, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Excellent. We have, uh, and we also have Richard Howarth. He's professor and chair of environmental studies at Dartmouth. He is an environmental and ecological economist who studies the interplay between economic analysis, uh, and the ecological, moral, and social dimensions of environmental governance. He's published extensively on a range of topics, including theories of discounting and intergenerational justice, uh, climate stabilization policy, post-carbon energy futures, and other topics. He's also the editor-in-chief of Ecological Economics. And last but not least, we have our very own uh, Satya Gopalakrishnan, uh, such as the Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Agricultural, Environmental, and Development Economics and on the faculty of the Environmental Science Graduate Program here at Ohio State. Uh, she received her PhD in Environmental and Resource Economics from Duke University in 2010 and in numerous publications, she focuses on applying economic theory to develop uh, models of complex human and natural systems the non-market valuation of environmental amenities and risks, and bioeconomic modeling, especially applied to uh, the valuation of uh, complex spatial systems like coastal and water resources. So thank you all very much uh, for taking the time to, to be here today. Thank you. Uh, so as, as Don said, uh, the discount rate in economics, it seems like a policy wonk uh, economics wonk kind of topic, but I'm going to try to introduce it for us. So how about this question? How much would you be willing to give up today to make your child $100 richer in 30 years? What about making your grandchild $100 richer uh, in 100 years? What about making your great, great, great grandchild richer in the very distant future? How much would you be willing to give up today? It turns out that climate policy might hinge on the answers to those questions. Despite the fact that some of the effects of climate change are happening faster than scientists predicted, unfortunately the effects are only going to get worse. Indeed, the worst consequences of climate change are likely to unfold only over decades or centuries. In other words, in our children's or grandchildren's or great-great-grandchildren's lifetimes. While most economists agree that the present generation should bear some costs, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions today, they disagree on how much it would be worth to spend and how quickly. Some economists claim that the world as a whole should be spending only small amounts to combat climate change now, ramping up slowly over time. 
This conclusion riles other econo economists, climate scientists, and environmentalists who argue that immediate action is the only way to forestall dreadful consequences for the future. The decision of how much and how fast to spend now to avert climate change hinges on assessing how much it is or should be worth now to prevent future damage. Indeed, some economists say we do or should value goods and bads in the future less than goods and bads in the present. Just how much less is captured by setting what is called a discount rate. One issue with the discount rate is that it compounds over time, like interest on your savings, right? I mean, all retirement saving is built on the idea of compounding. So discounting at a typical rate of 6%, for example, would mean that a million dollars of climate damage in 200 years has a disvalue of only $9 today. That means if society could take $9 and do something else with it in the near term that would produce benefits of $10, then our money is better spent doing that than preventing the future climate damage. On the other hand, many philosophers argue that barring cases at the margins, human beings are moral equals. A range of ways human beings can be different should have no relevance for how they should be valued or treated. Race, IQ, sex, nationality, left-handedness, and so on are what are called morally irrelevant criteria for unequal treatment. Because a human being lives on the other side of the world, in a different country, with a culture and language that is different than ours, does not in itself mean that harms and costs to such a person count for less, at least from the perspective of morality. But if where someone lives is morally irrelevant criteria for unequal treatment, then shouldn't when someone lives? If we have good reasons to think people will exist in 200 years, should they not be treated as equals in our weighing of costs and benefits today? Thus, our topic for today, what exactly is this discount rate? When and why do economists apply one when analyzing the costs and benefits of longer term alternative policies? What economic reasons support its use from the perspective of economics, efficiency, economic theory? And how does this discount rate get set? And finally, on the other hand, does the use of a discount rate fail to treat future generations as our moral equals? Is it therefore unethical to discount the future at all? Now, I'm not an economist, so I probably have not done a good job of a first attempt at explaining the discount rate. So first, I would like to ask the panel if they might do a better job. Uh, what, what exactly is a discount rate in discount rate uh, in economics and uh, when when is it used? Um, so I'm not so we'll I guess we'll figure out how to to navigate the panel. I mean maybe maybe we could just do round. We could just do a round. Yeah, we should start. With, uh, so yeah. maybe start. What, with John. What's going round and constitute? What's the, what's the order we're in? I can't can't tell. From oh, that's three. <laughs> Uh, so let's. I guess you should start. Let's do. Uh, I think let's you should start, John. John, Richard, <laughs> um, Well, thanks very much for the, for for the introduction. Um, it is a complicated topic, uh, and actually, I thought as you were speaking that maybe I could make a proposal that might simplify it, because nearly all the protagonists who think about this issue, agree with what you were saying towards the end, which is that we should treat human beings impartially. Human beings that live at a different time or in a different place, we should treat equivalently to nearby human beings. That's pretty much common ground amongst many philosophers and many economists. Most of the economists who, theoretical economists it is, for people who've written about the theory of the discount rate, do assume that. There is one very notable exception, and that is the great economist Ken Arrow, who within the last 20 years or so, 
was promoting the idea that actually it's perfectly permissible for us to give less weight to future people because they're more distant from us. And similarly, it's permissible for us to give less weight to people who are not close to us in, in space because they're more remote. He was thinking particularly of people who are related to us. He mm -hmm. thinks it's perfectly permissible for us to care more about our own children than about other people's children. So that we, so impartiality between everybody is not, is not a universal mark of morality. Morality may very well permit us to be partial towards people who are near. That's a good point. Um, I'm not sure how it, how successfully it translates into suggesting that distant future people should get more weight than near future people, because this is not a matter of relationship. Um, and he's, he's unusual. Most of the economists who've written on this subject have believed in impartiality between people. So um, I would think that perhaps to simplify the argument, the discussion we're going to have, perhaps we could sort of take that as a, a starting axiom. And then we can discuss what is the sort of discounting that economists recommend, and is it justified? But it may be, maybe we shouldn't take that for granted. Great, I'll, I'll bite on that. I think that that's an interesting argument. And, I, and of course, you're right about Professor Arrow. Um, I think about the, the Copeman's proof that in, in the infinite time horizon world, that uh, utility function isn't going to converge unless the discount rate is, is, is positive. And Arrow and, and Partha Dasgupta and others have argued that that justifies utility discounting. Um, but I'd agree with you that, that if I think like a philosopher, rather than just as an economist, then ethics is about equal treatment in some sense. What, what I would wonder is, what, are, what exactly are our obligations towards future generations? And is it equal weighing in a consequentialist calculus? Is it providing them with opportunities that are as good as the current generation? Um, is it providing them with specific endowments of natural capital? Um, and, it's, and how does that fit in? How do our obligations and duties to future generations uh, fit with our altruistic concern for their well-being? Um, and I'll, I'll put the idea out there that I'm not sure that discounting solves the, solves the, the ethical problem. Um, I think I'm more of a deontologist on the ethics side. Um, but I, I, I think that we should not be reductionist and think that we solve the discounting problem or really the intergenerational justice problem just by choosing one number. I think that's probably a point where we right. all agree. And I agree with you, John, about impartiality, but we can be impartial in a whole variety of ways in terms of how we think about intergenerational justice. Right. Great, thank you. I would agree with, uh, with everything I've heard so far. Um, the, uh, the only thing I might add to this is that uh, the moral equivalence of how we value well-being is different or does not immediately translate to how we allocate resources. And so if climate change or any uh, mitigation of climate change or how we invest in, in how we invest today in building capital, and I'm going to call that natural capital, uh, which may or may not be substitutable, but those investments do not necessarily mean a lower value on, on future generations as yeah. much as uh, it is how we do this allocation in a way that we maintain some form of non-declining welfare. Yeah. If that is a uh, reasonable starting point. Well, I'll just observe that non-declining welfare is maybe something that we owe to future generations. And one view in, in economics in particular is the weak sustainability idea that we're obliged to ensure that well-being is maintained over time. We're not obliged to make them better off. And can, can I um, come back to something, that, an important thing that, that Richard was saying? Um, there is this strand of thought in economics. Uh, that you really do have to discount future people's well-being in order to get sensible answers mm -hmm. coming out of your theory. This was 
especially conspicuous in Koopman's work um, because he assumed that time would go on forever. Okay. And it's quite easy to dismiss that argument because time is not going to go on forever. We live in a finite world. But Pathadas Gupta, um, Pathadas Gupta's version of that is not that that you cannot come up with sensible answers if time is infinite without discounting, but that the answers you come up with, even if time is relatively short, um, are really very implausible if you don't discount the future. Um, he did calculations to suggest that if we took the sort of standard um, parameters that economists uh, tend to feed into their data, we would end up in saving 40, 50, 60 percent, or maybe even more, of our current income for the future um, if we're going to be impartial just because the future goes on for a long time. Um, a small sacrifice that we make now delivers benefits to people for a very long time. And that means there are huge benefits that can be got from a small, uh, a small investment now. Um, and if you don't discount those benefits at all, then that will be very demanding on us. It's a version of a well-known um, objection to utilitarian thinking, which is fully impartial, that it's too demanding. Um, and being fully impartial between us and future people, according to Das Gupta, may be uh, too demanding on us. Um, what's the answer for that? Um, well, I think it's, I mean, what makes this particularly poignant is that we, we still, if we believe the economic models, we still expect future people to be better off than us, despite climate change. And it seems odd for us to make a sacrifice for the sake of lots of future people who are going to be better off than us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the, 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 the worry that Gascoptre is pointing to, that we don't want to make sacrifices for the sake of large numbers of <laughs> people who are very nicely situated compared with us. Um, so I don't think it's such a worry as he thinks it is. Good, so... Yeah, uh, that, that does get to... Wait, I'm sorry, is there a speak? Who's talking? No, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking about also um, utilitarianism, if we took it at face value, would mean that we in the North, the global North, should all substantially reduce our current consumption and transfer it to the global South to achieve distributional or international justice, right? Um, and so utilitarianism is a pretty demanding theory if we take it at face value, and it would mean large resource transfers from from wealthy people today to poorer people today, and also transfers from the present generation to the fu to future generations. You know, and it is a paradox. Why should people in the present who might be relatively worse off make sacrifices so that people in the future who might be much better off can be even better off than they might be otherwise? I mean, that to, to me, that's partly why I I don't. I don't really buy into utilitarianism um, as, a, as a theory, partly for that reason. Although I'd say that, um, you know, when I'm teaching this stuff, I, Don, I use your, is it 2008 Scientific American paper? You have the idea of prioritarianism, right? Um, and that's a, 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 often prioritarianism is an exam question that pops up in my class from, from time to time. And so there are, in the consequentialist tradition, um, there are ways of, of of giving weight to people who are relatively worse off, right? So. Yes, and if we apply prioritarianism between us and the future, it will increase the weight we give to ourselves and decrease the weight we give to the future so long as the future is better off than us. So it will permit us to be less generous to the future than we would be if we were utilitarians. Um, yeah which is the way that Partha Dasgupta thinks. He thinks that if we're utilitarians and we don't believe in discounting, we should give huge amounts to the future. A way of dealing with that is to be prioritarian and um, count ourselves more than those future people just because they're better off than us. Yeah. Which in, in many of these, uh, of the economic, uh, economic models or economic theory would suggest that that just accounts for a for an expected growth in the economy that would then adjust for those, you know, for 
discounting being a way, even if we said that your pure time preference, that we don't necessarily say that future is discounted from a pure, from a pure time preference, there is a growth associated and therefore you, we can discount utility in the future uh, because future generations are going to grow, which is the, the Ramsey style growth model. Could I uh, push back on that assumption and ask whether that still is an assumption that, that we should be using? And what about the possibility that climate change would uh, has nonlinear uh, uh, tipping points um, and the possibility of, of real catastrophes from, from climate change? Is it fair to assume that even with climate harms, future generations on aggregate will be wealthier than us? No, I don't think it's fair to assume it. That is the expectation at the moment, but there is a serious worry that things will get very, very much worse. Um, uh, after all, as things are going just now, it looks as if we are expecting three degrees of warming, maybe even four degrees of warming. Um, the nations have committed themselves to try and aim for one and a half degrees, but that just seems to be a fantasy. We're not going to get down to one and a half degrees. We're going to get certainly more than two degrees. And this is this is serious global warming. So we do have to worry that, um, that, that, that the economy is not going to go on uh, growing. That's part of the uncertainty we face. So one of the things we have to think about in wondering about how to assess the future is how to deal with the uncertainty. We don't know whether people are going to be better off, whether they're going to be worse off. Uh, how they're going to be depends partly on what we do, and it also depends on the way that nature behaves, and we don't very well know that how nature is going to behave. So the huge uncertainty is one of the things that we need to take into account. Yes. And, there's, and, and, there's and that includes the possibility we're worse off. I mean, there's also an aggregation problem here that we don't live in a world where there's a representative agent either now or in, or in the future. Mm -hmm. There are vast inequalities within, certainly, you know, the United States or the global north, there's vast inequality. And then if we extend that to the global south, I mean, the, the urgent moral problem isn't making wealthy people wealthier. It's, it's, it's dealing with the hardships that are faced by the two billion people or so who are living in poverty. And what, what I would say is that the uncertainty problem is fundamental, and I want to come back to that. But what do we do if we have a world of uneven development, and if it's emissions coming from supporting relatively affluent lifestyles and technologies today, and the costs are falling on people living 50, 100 years in the future who might be living um, in, you know, in poverty, literally. Even if, even if average incomes are increasing, it's not clear to me that we will solve the, the global poverty problems. Um, and, and those two things need to come into focus, I think, more than they have. There's a, there's a really interesting um, paper by David Anthoff and Richard Cole that came out some years ago that was looking at welfare weights that is basically not focusing on averaging between uh, across the whole world, but, but looking at different segments of society or different countries and, and giving the most weight to countries or really individuals within countries who are facing the greatest hardship. And I think that points back kind of in the direction of prioritarianism, but it's over both space and time, I think. Yeah. Well, I was going to break, I was also going to talk about uncertainty and the, yeah. uh, so the question that in my mind is, is this really, uh, is this argument about discounting or is it about understanding and dealing with uncertainty, which the, the critique to econo econ economic analysis and cost-benefit analysis in particular is this idea of if you're, going to, if you're going to discount the future, you're not going to, we're not going to care enough about doing anything. But is, is that really the question when our, our understanding or the uncertainty in what we can say about the costs and about those benefits are so huge that you know economists like Marty Weitzman would argue that cost-benefit analysis has to be thrown out of the window if, in fact, you have these large uncertainties, not just in what those costs or what those damages or benefits might be from investments today, but also in knowing what the structure of the 
utility function or the benefit function damages might be. So not just uncertainty in what those damages are, but uncertainty in how we could even characterize those damages, which then means there's no way we could do any cost-benefit analysis. That's one argument, and it is, even within economics, that is a pretty uh, well-known debate between uh, Weizmann and Bob Pindyke on whether this is the way to go or not, because what that would in, what that would mean if we did, if we placed a zero discount rate, that would mean that we might end up having to commit the entire GDP and uh, the same argument that that Parthadas Gupta would make, and therefore there yeah. is some need to prioritize where and how we make investments today versus how we deal with uh, with uncertainty and these potentially catastrophic events that could uh, that could occur in the future. Yeah, and even if I... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask. So we have to make decisions today about the effort to put into uh, minimizing climate change. Um, that involves some balancing of future benefits against present costs. Right. So how do we not do cost-benefit analysis? We are in a position where we have to do it. We maybe have to develop our methods, but the decision that we've got to make involves weighing costs against benefits. Or another way of putting it is that we have a duty not to inflict harm on future generations, and that if we don't know whether our actions would inflict, inflict harm or not, then we have a duty not to undertake those actions. Um, and that's a kind of hedge against uncertainty. Um, of course, if, if you take that argument to the extreme, then that ties us all up in knots, and then we can never really, we can never really do anything. Um, but you know, it's 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 certainly correct that there's a. I mean, if I think about the economic theory here. Even if I'm not concerned about intergenerational justice and I'm only concerned about efficiency, then I need to calculate first um, expected or average damages. And, and, and calculating that expectation means knowing the range of things that can happen and then assigning probability weights across them. And for the discount rate, the discount rate is then equal to the risk-free rate of return plus a risk premium. Um, and the thing is, is that for, for safe assets, the risk-free return is between zero and 1% per year um, above inflation. Um, you know, then the, all of the weight about dealing with uncertainty is understanding how large or small that risk premium should be that we're discounting this uncertain future benefit stream. And on that level, we don't know the data that are required really to do that calculation. I mean, I've done those calculations myself by making a lot of assumptions, but we also don't have a very good theory of exactly why, how to, what the risk premium should be. Um, should, we know that things that increase portfolio risk should have high discount rates and things that alleviate overall risks should have lower um, risk premia, but we don't have a, a, a particularly good basis for, for figuring that out. So it's difficult. It is difficult. <laughs> I mean, that's what you pointed out, that doing the cost-benefit analysis is a, is a very difficult thing to do. And um, that includes, part of that includes what to do about risk with the, with the discount rate. But I don't see we have any alternative but to try to do it. We have to do our best, as far as I can see. Mm. Um, I, I mean, you did actually mention one possibility, which is that we could we could have a deontic theory that says do not do anything which risks harming future people but that would lead to paralysis because mm -hmm. we have no idea about the way that nature works and more or less anything we could do exposes some has some risk of damaging future people so i, I think we can't take that that no and I, i'd agree with i would agree with that and if, if i say that future generations have a a negative right to be protected against harm, and then um, the present generation has a positive right to um, emit stuff in order to contribute to our current economy, then the, those of us on the, on the deontology side are at, at pains to figure out how to adjudicate conflicts between those two rights. And then that comes down to some of the same issues, I guess, right? Uh, well, I suppose, but that would 
that would be a hard right to claim, wouldn't it? That we have a right to emit greenhouse gas in just because we do it. <laughs> well, we have a right uh, to economic. We have a right to economic liberty, and and so then the question is when and and to what extent are are there are there duties to to impose limits on that um, out of respect for others or to avoid harming others, right? That's all I'm saying. Yeah, but, but we're thinking in a context where the IPCC says that by the end of this century, emissions of greenhouse gas have to be zero net mm -hmm. or even negative. So we can't think that we have a right to emissions of greenhouse gas, or if we did think that, then we're doomed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We've got to stop these emissions. That's what we're told at any rate. So it's, we shouldn't be claiming rights to things that are going to lead to the destruction of the world. Aside from it being a, a right of whether we can or cannot use uh, natural resources, whether we can or cannot emit greenhouse gases, um, I think one issue that does not come into this debate at all, which is, and, and perhaps not not quite as relevant to this discussion, but, but I still want to bring it up, is that um, part of this comes down to a proper, if cost-benefit analysis is something we have to do because that, that is the way we make, we have to make allocation decisions, then we need to be able to price the impact of our decisions right. And that is where a lot of the, you know, if, and environmental economists spend most of their time trying to figure out what the value or the costs of externalities are. And to, the, to a large extent, greenhouse gases or emission of greenhouse gases are a right only because we're not paying for it. Yeah, so you're both arguing that, that I mean, this is a very traditional view, obviously, in certainly Anglo-Saxon law, that we have a, a right to be protected from harm, and that that trumps uh, rights of economic freedom. So that, that's one answer to the conflict here, which points towards a, a strong sustainability rule, I, I, I guess. Um, but if we take that too far, then we can never emit anything, that's because right. every, every single gram of emissions inflicts some harm, right? So there's, right. there needs to be some some tolerance there as we make a transition towards the post-carbon economy. But so in, even in the law of negligence, for example, uses, uh, navigates that tension with the reasonable person standard or the idea of, uh, of some sort of responsibility of taking due care, right? So it doesn't say that it's always wrong to harm others. Um, and it doesn't say yeah. that, that it's always wrong to, to uh, not, you know, to not take care in all of your actions, but there is a reasonable standard of due care. Is that, yeah. do you think that that might, uh, that kind of thinking might be able to fill in the place of cost benefit analysis thinking about climate change? Um, and then uh, that would allow us to treat future generations as our moral equals in a way that's justifiable to them um, and, and sort of a, a way of navigating that. Well, it, it does seem like, to come back to your initial example, I mean, I forget your exact number, but what I tell my students is that you know, if $100 of, of future costs or damages imposed 100 years from the present has a value of less than a dollar today, so we're supposed to we're supposed to be okay for us to take actions that benefit us personally that impose $100 of costs on on the on the future. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a there's an asymmetry there that comes back down to the discounting problem, I think. And and, and then that part of the answer is that. If we were to, to deplete those resources or impose those harms, we ought to put that money in the bank, and then the, with compounding, then we would be compensating future generations. Um, maybe that argument works, but there, there is that asymmetry. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I say something about that? Um, if, you, if your discounting does bring the hundred dollars in a hundred years' time down to one dollar now, what that means is that a hundred dollars to those people living in a hundred years time brings the same benefit to them as one dollar brings to us. If, if, we, if we started from the position that I suggested at the beginning, so we should be totally impartial, 
between the well-being of different people, then that would be built into the way we calculate the discount rate. We should be valuing things in the future according to how much benefit they bring to the people living in the future. And if goods worth $100 to people in the future bring the same benefit as goods worth $1 bring to us now, now then we've got the correct uh, discount rate when we evaluate 100 as one. It's not the week that we're somehow taking a greater benefit for ourselves from the people in the future. Mm. We're taking, taking it that our benefit is exactly equal to their benefit in value. And we're using the discount rate to ensure that that's what we achieve in our economic policy. I mean, that's what we assume. So, so, so perhaps I can stress. Yeah. When we, talk, when we talk about discount rate, there are many things we could be talking about. We could mm -hmm. be talking about discounting future people's well-being. Mm -hmm. But few people think we should do that. Mm -hmm. I mentioned Arrow. You mentioned, Richard mentioned Koopmans and Dasgupta. There are a few, a few economists who think that. But many of the other economists think differently. Ramsey thought we should be impartial, Soto thought we should be impartial, and so on. We could pick all a number of great economists, and the majority of them would be in favor of being impartial between one generation and another generation. So far as their well being is concerned. But Solo, Solo wasn't arguing for a zero utility discount rate. Solo was arguing that what our obligation was is to ensure that opportunities to maintain the quality of life were passed on. So Solo is actually more on the deontology side and the rights-based side than right. on the consequentialist side, I think. All right. Yeah, so I was putting a consequentialist gloss on it because I was talking about <laughs> well-being. It may be the things that we should value are not well-being, but opportunities to achieve well-being or something yeah. like that. Quite yeah. right, so, so thank yeah. you. But at any rate, the, the, the point is that we are being, or trying to be impartial between the present generation and the future generation. We should hold that constant. We should, we could, we should recognize that we should be impartial about the things that matter. And that will then determine how we should evaluate the instrumental goods, the things like the food, the bicycles and so on, which bring benefits to people. Mm -hmm. if, we keep, if we're impartial about benefits or whatever, what matters, we can then think how should we attach value to the things that bring benefits. And that's, that's what the economic theory is about, really. Mm -hmm. which, does also bring it, which, which does also hinge on some notion of substitutability, which is what leads to, I mean, the, the weak sustainability argument, because the strong sustainability argument is, uh, has its limits. At some point, we're not, we can't yeah. stop all activity because we <laughs> assume we can't use any uh, of the existing resources, at least the depletable ones. So from a weak sustainability argument, which is a, a policy, uh, which at least provides some kind of policy guidance, uh, there, is, there is both the need to think about how we discount utility or not, and also how if, we, if what we want to hold constant is the opportunity to maintain well-being, it doesn't necessarily have to be with the exact same endowment of resource that we have today. That's true, yeah. But the, but the sustainability, the substitutability uh, issue doesn't often or doesn't get into this discussion as, 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 as often as uncertainty and discounting. We've only been talking about uncertainty and discounting. I, I don't think we're, uh, we're, we've, we've thought more carefully enough about how substitutability might actually be the driver where you could have some kind of a Cobb-Douglas style, uh, you know, an indifference curve that goes to a limit because there are critical thresholds where we have no substitutability, which will, so with the constant elasticity of substitution, that could potentially go to zero at for certain sorts of uh, goods and certain kinds of assets and yeah. allowing substitutability for certain other kinds of assets, which means that we're going to be discounting the use of certain resources versus others. Yeah, but that's, we have to recognize that. So yeah. we, we hear talking about the discount rate, but we shouldn't be doing that. 
first of all, we can, we can, I'd be suggesting that we can all agree that there shouldn't be a discount rate on what really matters to people. We should keep, we should be impartial about that. Then there's the question of how does that translate into discount rates on material goods, the things that give us whatever we really care about. And for some of them, the, should, there should be a zero discount rate or even a negative discount rate. And these are the ones that can't be substituted for. These is, these, those, as time goes on, are going to get more and more expensive relative to other goods. So what's called the own rate of interest on those or the own rate of discount will be low and possibly even positive. Every different sort of good has its own rate of discount. Right. And when we talk about the discount rate, it's a sort of mashup of all the different rates that apply to the different different goods. Yeah. I mean, it's not unreasonable to have a mashup, um, but we need to know that that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. yes. So, uh, so, so John, for in your view, the discount rate would be set based on uh, some understanding of uh, the future value or the future scarcity of that good. But what are other what are what are ways that people have made this mashup? That is, if we are going to use a discount rate, if we do yeah. have to, to add up the costs and benefits of climate change, how should we yeah. go about setting that? Should it be small? Should it be large? What considerations should come into how much we discount uh, uh, harms in the future or costs in the future? Okay, I saw two parts to that question. The first is. How, how are all these different discount rates going to be lumped together um, in the calculations? And, and there is a proper way of doing that, according to the theory, which is to um, evaluate the goods that you have at all the different times according what, to what their value is at that time. So if we have some very scarce resource and its value increases over time, its relative value relative to other goods will increase over time. And when we value all the goods together in the future, it will get a very high weight because at that point it's, it's very valuable. So when you um, put together in a lump some measure of the goods that are available at a particular time, you will do that taking account of the different relative values that these goods have. And that will give you what we could call a money measure of the value of goods in the future. Mm -hmm. And then you can apply a single discount rate to that money measure. And you will have taken account of the difference in discount rates by changing, by taking account of the way in which the values of these things change right. uh, over time. So we can construct um, uh, a, uh, what's called a numeraire, a thing to apply a single discount rate to. And it will be a sort of index of all the different goods. Then there's the question of how you evaluate what that discount rate should be. That's the second question. Mm -hmm. And my own view is that we should apply something called the, the Ramsey rule, which or the Ramsey formula, which some people have heard of and some people wouldn't. Um, formula that comes from the most extraordinary genius of the early part of the 20th century, Frank Ramsey, who achieved huge amounts of advances, both in philosophy and economics, and did so before he died at the age of 29. Wow. But one of the things he discovered was a formula for working out what the discount rate on commodities should be, which can be applied bearing in mind that we are not going to discount the benefits or what's truly valuable to future people. We're only going to discount the, the um, goods that come to them. And a, and a crucial part of this formula is it depends how much better off than us we are. If they're better off, we can apply a positive discount rate. If they're worse off than us, we should apply a negative discount rate. So the appropriate discount rate depends on what's going to happen to the economy. And I think everybody recognizes that. If the economy is going downhill, then we should have a negative discount rate. If it's going uphill, we should have a positive one. Yeah, and that's a, there's an there's a important paper by by Thomas Sterner and Michael Hole that makes that argument and links it up with uncertainty. But there's a, there's a problem with the Ramsey formula, and that is that it's the model of perfect decision making with an infinite time horizon with an infinitely lived agent under perfect foresight. And when we take Ramsey's rule and we try to adapt it for uncertainty and we look at 
returns on investment in different assets and different risk classes, then what we see is that we, we, we get to the problem of the equity, um, you know, the, the equity premium puzzle. And that's, it's not a rich enough model to actually explain why asset prices and rates of return on market investments are the way that they are when we take uncertainty into account. And in my opinion, there's, it's, it's interesting, there's been a disjuncture between the environmental economics literature, which is leaning hard on Ramsey's rule, and then the finance literature, which is saying, oh my goodness, um, we actually don't know how, how exactly to understand the psychology and the, and the decision science that lies behind how people are, are making asset pricing decisions, which is a one piece with where the discount rate comes from um, in a descriptive theory. Not a okay, thank you. Yeah. You, you know this more than I do. Um, I, I think it's actually not correct, though, to say that Ramsey assumes a single uh, infinitely lived individual. Um, what is implicit in his formula, I think, is a, is, is a particular ethical theory um, that handles population in a particular way. Perhaps okay. I should say something about this. When, when we're trying to evaluate the future compared with the present, one thing we've got to take account of is that the population of people in the future is going to be different from what it is uh, now. And if you fit yeah. population into Ramsey's formula, it implies a particular view about the value of having extra people, a view that we call total utilitarianism. Ramsey yeah. implies that the value of the world is the total of the well-being of the people who are in it, which many people disagree with. So. That's a reason for doubting the formula, I agree. Yeah, and, and it, I mean, it, it's also interesting. I mean, if none of these models really deal with the moral philosophy problem that we choose how large or small the future population is. And future generations, at least if we get to the unborn, are contingent and are, and are potential persons rather than actual persons. And Derek Parfit tells us that we should worry a lot about that contingency. Um, I'm not sure that I agree. I think that's an interesting puzzle, but I mean, that's another dimension of this very complicated set of issues. How far are we going with this? Uh, we have to pull <laughs> off the moderator. I mean, you've just pointed that out. That's exactly the reason why I don't think that the right approach to the analysis is in terms of um, the rights of future generations. Okay. Because the existence of the future generations, which people exist in the future, depends on what we do. Dick. So I think that justice is not an appropriate tool for um, thinking about our responsibility to future generations. Well, I know that my, my own writing on that is that if what we are, what we are, children who are alive and well today, is an ability to have a, a quality of life that is as good as ours. And part of a quality of life is an ability to have children and to look after your own obligations to your own unborn future children. And, and I think actually that we're in a world where we look at the fact that over the generations overlap rather than being a sequence of disconnected, disjoint um, uh, generations, then that changes the way we think about both the economics and the, and the ethics. Although I realize that that's a, is that a minority view. I'm not sure it is, but it's, it's, uh, that's not the, the main way that, that, that this has been, been looked at um, recently. So, uh John, you suggested that we should well, we should set this discount rate, uh, discounting at least as far not the future uh, people's well-being, but the uh, the value of certain goods in the future. That we can yeah. kind of come to a discount rate based on how better off we think they'll be economically, let's say, than than we are. Um, but a lot of people uh, and and um, Richard mentioned the descriptive approach. I think I don't. Uh, some economists think to set the discount rate, we should actually look at people's behavior in the market today, uh, and and that um, that expresses their, in a sense, uh, reveals their preferences about how much they genuinely care about the future. Um, mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. And and some have even argued that that is a more democratic approach to setting the discount rate parameter in economics than, um, than, than us, you know, philosophers, economists sitting together and thinking, um, what should we set the discount rate? So I, I wondered if you, if you could uh, all sort of speak to that, that idea. So if I can just, I, I'll make just one point, which is that uh, I think 
the way we think about market behavior and what we observe in determining uh, discount rates or how people make decisions in their own lives uh, are actually different from the way you would expect a social planner or anyone making decisions about what the social value that we place on the future should be. So uh, mm -hmm. that, in my mind, is, is, the, is the first argument for why we don't want to think about issues such as climate change or things where we are looking at very low probability, very large damages in the long run uh, with the same lens that we think about financial decisions that we make in as individual economic agents in our own lives. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I believe in democracy. I think that the discount rate should be uh, applied by a government which is um, uh, democrat democratically responsible. Um, but it's a part of democracy that people should think about the true value of things. It's not as though the way that democracy should operate is that the preferences that people should happen to have at any particular time should entirely control what happens. So when we think about the discount rate, we're thinking about what should be done about climate change. This is in order to inform the electorate. It's in order to inform the people who are going to be go using the political process to determine what our governments do. So we're not trying to overrule the people. What we're trying to do is persuade the people that this is the right way to think. We, we are doing our best to provide a correct means of judging how the future should be compared with the present. Agreed, but isn't, isn't democracy or a democratic uh, decision process always going to uh, invariably end up ha generating losers with who are going to be the minority populations in any in any uh, situation so isn't that why we need to step in with with a with some form of governance uh, to tip the balance there or for equity and justice reasons yeah, no I was agreeing and presumably the electorate would agree with that too um, so, so we don't have direct democracies. What we have is representative democracies in which allow for these things, that points that you've been making, that there are, we need protection for minorities, uh, for example. But, but I suppose the point that I wanted to make is that the market is not a democratic process. So if, the, if what comes out of um, this way of thinking is that the discount rate should be the market rate of interest, then that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, if we're thinking about something that's different from the market rate of interest, it doesn't mean that we're not democratic. It means that we recognize that the market is not a proper democratic process. Of course it's not. It gives more weight to the interests of the rich people, for example. Okay. So, so we shouldn't think of the, the market as a substitute for democracy. We are doing democracy in the sort of argument that we're having today. We are discussing what the discount rate should be for the sake of informing the democratic process. But if I think if I think about the democratic problem, and again I come to things thinking about life cycle models and about overlapping generations, and the conspicuous thing that I see front and center is that is that the current generation is making massive investments in young people who are moral subjects um, rather than moral agents at this at this stage. And are we doing that because of, of an obligation to them, or are we doing it out of some sense of altruism? I think about Passmore's um, argument in, um, in his 1974 book, where he argues that actually the, the, the way to think about the future generation problem is, is love, actually, right? And it's, it's, about a, it, it's about beautiful action to confer benefits on others, even though we're not obligated to do so. And you know what's interesting in the economics of that, if we have a certain degree of altruism towards our students, our students, our, you can see where I'm coming from at the end of the term, um, towards our children, and then we uh, make investments in school systems and other kinds of capital, including their human capital, that lead them to have lives that are better than ours, are we really obligated to increase, to decrease the, the discount rate? Um, I'm not sure. 
maybe we should use an efficiency argument for allocating capital to the to the most um, productive uses. Um, but it's not clear to me that we need to set the return on investment based on a, a utilitarian rule per se. Um, that, that's a little complicated. We live in a mixed economy where intergenerational transfers, whether it's social security or it's educational expenditures, are very much uh, determined by, in the public sector, by politics. And they're a big part of the economy. Uh, so, so you, so uh, none of you would suggest that we look to uh, that we look to let the market rate of, or market interest rates or any aspects like that when when doing valuation for uh, for problems like climate change. That there's not there's not something that we can take some kind of um, view about um, about future generations that we should take from the actual practices of. Of, of our economy. Actually, I, I would I would take a little bit of issue with that. I mean, I I would say if we were only interested in economic efficiency and we set aside the intergenerational justice problems, then we look at the fact that the that the the risk free rate of return is at or below one percent per year. And if we look at climate stabilization policies, if we think that the climate change mitigation is is a kind of insurance policy that that mitigates potentially catastrophic future risks, the risk premium might be negative. And so even based on an efficiency argument, we might have a, 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 a discount rate for climate change policies that's, you know, 1% plus or minus. Um, you know, and I, I guess that I, I'm not sure that that's the right answer. I think that's the answer that comes when you look at that problem from the efficiency perspective. Mm -hmm. And then I think what all three of us are saying is that there are so many perspectives that there are many different questions that then point to different answers, right? Right, right. Good, well, I think maybe on that note, we'll have more questions. Uh, questions from the <laughs> audience? Great, so um, you won't be able to see them, but hopefully you'll be able to hear, uh, hear people if you wanna. Uh, we're just getting a mic set up. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, um, so I have a very elementary question about the assumption that future generations will be better off. Um, forget about climate change for the time being, so just pretend that that's not happening. Um, um, why do economists assume that future generations will be better off than present generations. Um, are, they, are they assuming that uh, on average, people in the future will be better off than people today are? Are they uh, merely assuming that the total amount of well-being in the future will be greater than the total amount of well-being that currently exists, perhaps because there will be more people in the future than there will be today? Are they assuming uh, both of those things because they think that uh, the population will continue to grow and that on average people will be better off and what makes them think that people will be better off I mean um, are they wh what relationship are they assuming between um, well-being and material goods are they assuming that the more material goods someone has the better off they are I'm, I'm afraid I didn't hear quite a lot of that question, um, but I heard some of it. So shall I start by trying to give an answer to the parts that I heard? So if yeah. I understood it, what you were asking was, why do economists think the future people, first of all, why do economists think the future people are better off? And secondly, what do they mean when they say that? Mm -hmm. um, why they say it is that they've 
fed things into their very elaborate models, um, which is supposed to integrate the economy and the climate system. And often they come out showing that there is economic growth. What they mean by it, I, I, I caught one, one thing you asked, are they taking account of the degradation in nature, should we say? And the answer to that is no, they're not. I mean, I think that when they say people are better off, they mean they're richer in material terms um, rather than uh, in overall well-being or anything uh, of that sort. That's, I think, the best I can say by way of answer to the parts of the question that I heard. I, I, perhaps the others heard more. I, I, I look at it a little bit historically. I mean, certainly out in the post-war years, there was a belief in economic growth and a belief that economic growth translated into a narrowing of inequality and that everyone would be better off. I mean, that, goes, that almost goes back to John Stuart Mill's ideas in his, his essay on the stationary state, where he saw economic growth as a transition process that was necessary to lead, to alleviate material scarcity so that human beings could, turn, to, could get on with, with what was really important in life. But I mean, we look at the United States and we see actually that real wages for male workers have not budged in the last 40 years. And we see that average life satisfaction isn't higher now than it was 30 or 40 years ago. And so we can ask ourselves even whether, even my generation, I mean, I'm in my 50s, we can ask whether my generation is better off than my parents' generation was. And yes and no, or it's complicated. And that, I, certainly my students, um, I don't think that my students are counting on being better off than, than, than we are. I think that they're looking at the future and, and wondering what we do to ensure that it's, that it's the kind of world that they want to help bring into being. Um, and, and I think, John, you're right that we believe in economic growth because our models, as they're parameterized, tell us that the economy should grow in a certain way, right? Um, and, and another way of thinking about it is that we'll get a future that we can't predict exactly, but the future that comes into being will be what, in some sense, what we've chosen to bring into being. The, um, the argument, or at least what we mean by saying better off or economic growth, I think does basically go back to some form of net national product. And there may be ways to tie that back into what that means for just consumption, production, capital, and other forms of capital. But it doesn't, it is a, an aggregate measure of the different kinds of capital that are in an economy at any given point in time, including the, including consumption goods, material, Manufactured capital, natural capital, human capital, and that together is what is is what the at least in any model is suggesting that there is some economic growth rate that is associated with it. And yeah. there again, there are that is not as easy to do in and of itself because we don't quite know how to value natural capital. We don't have that answer for everything. We're we're getting better at and and we are able to value certain types of natural capital, but from, a, from, from the argument of is that value neutral, I would say that that is not, uh, because it, is still, it still hinges on observed market behavior to back out what the value of goods and services or capital that we don't transact in a market are. And so that still does get back to the value being placed by the players or by actors who do engage with in the market. Yeah, and if we look at welfare indicators that look at the monetary value of non-market goods, and they look at the depletion of natural capital, then the trend can look a lot different than the trend for unadjusted GDP. Yeah. And actually, in those kinds of calculations, one of the main drivers is the social cost of carbon, or it's the monetary value that we assign to greenhouse gas emissions. And that depends, that, that comes back to the discount rate. Um, so this becomes very circular and interdependent in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. I think in order for them to hear, we might need to have questioners stand up next to the table, because they can only hear good okay. Can I, can I say, I get a lot of distortion from this microphone, remote microphone. I don't know, is, are you able to hear what's happening, Richard? I can't very yeah. clearly. 
I can hear you extremely clearly, but not from the microphone, no, the roving microphone, whatever it is. That's to stay there, we oh. can't hear them at all. Uh, but if we get close maybe, to them, we I think one of the microphones must not be getting through to me properly. Yeah, so. I can't hear. Hi, can you hear, can you hear me? That's clear, yes. Okay, we're going to ask the questioners to come up uh, closer to uh, the screen that's projecting you, and we think you'll be able to hear them then. So we'll just uh, Thank you. give you one sec. Does someone uh, does someone else have a, a question they'd like to ask or? If no one else wants to go out and follow, but someone else would go. Follow up, okay. excellent. Right. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. I was the person who asked the first question, okay. and I have a follow up for you, John. So I I thought I heard you say that. What economists mean when they say that people will be better off is something like people will be richer or there will be more material goods. So yeah. if that's what they mean when they say people will be better off, then they're using the phrase better off in a very different way from the way that philosophers would use that phrase to, to, to well, indicate that people are higher. In, as a matter of fact. Yeah, but exactly. I mean, I'm not sure that they particularly Economists do tend to slip into better off, but what they mean is more more wealth, more material wealth. Right. So so now if that's what if, if that's what they mean when they say that future generations will be better off, then the idea that we shouldn't be sacrificing now for the sake of people who are, who will be better off than we are, uh, that that the idea that there's something perverse about that because it's like the poor giving to the rich. Uh, that argument doesn't seem as compelling anymore because if there's no relationship between, you know, uh, being better off in material terms and being better off in the sense that actually matters, namely in terms of well-being, then for all that we've said, it could be that uh, people's lives will, in the sense that actually matters, be worse in the future even though they will have more material goods then, than mm -hmm. we do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That, uh, that's true. Um, one thing I, I should say, though, is that when we talk about the discount rate, if at any rate we're doing what I suggested, which is not suggesting there should be any discount on future well-being, but merely a discount on future material goods, yeah. then it's how many material goods people have got that is important. So yeah. what, we're, what we're interested in is the contribution that extra material goods make to their well-being. If in other respects they're worse off, they still may be getting, um, they, we can still expect them to be getting a smaller addition to their well-being as a result of extra food or bicycles or whatever it is. So we should still be discounting future material goods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I agree that um, we, we shouldn't slip into assuming that material wealth is the same as well-being. Uh, some of the terminology just let us do that. That's a mistake. Thank you. And it, I mean, to me, it's interesting that we haven't mentioned Sam's work tonight. Sam, in the old days, wrote about discounting, but I mean, I, I, I'm influenced, I would say, by his book on justice, and I think his capabilities approach is a very interesting way of thinking about what duties might be or, or how we might approach thinking about climate justice and about the conservation of natural capital. I mean, it seems like conserving ecosystems and conserving the functioning of the climatic system is an important capability amongst others. Um, and then some would say that we should focus on, on, on protecting and sustaining a whole vector of, of capabilities rather than trying to reduce things to one measure. Now, he has a 700-page book, and it re doesn't really get to a bottom line that a consequentialist would, would deem satisfactory, but I mean, it's, it, it is another reference point here. And it's interesting philosophically. What? So may, may I just, I mean, I, I want to clarify, not push back, but just clarify uh, this argument that if we say we should not discount what matters to people in the future and their well-being, but we need, but we, we do need to discount what we can aggregate as gross national product, for example, um, how do we 
as in present generation that are making decisions about how to allocate scarce resources today make any judgment. So this is going even beyond what might be uncertain or what we may know about something we don't know to having no clue what it is that could matter for future generations. So how do we even begin to make that sort of an economic policy argument if we are not aggregating it to something that we can measure? Well, I, I, if the question's directed to me, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to an argument that I think is from Parfit. Mm -hmm. Parfit would say that the futurity of harms does not reduce the, the, um, the moral importance of harms, right? Um, but it, what it means is that because we can put money in the bank and the money earns a positive rate of interest, then we can compensate future harms at pennies on the dollar relative to the present. So on an, on, a, on an efficiency basis, we can justify using market-based returns on investments in, in, in discounting to figure out what compensation is due to future generations when we're replacing one form of capital or one kind of asset um, with another. Um, and that takes the, the, the moral pressure off of the discount rate and puts it onto the question about, well, what 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 is it, what is it exactly that future generations have an entitlement to or that we think that they deserve or that we choose to transfer to them? And is it Solo's idea of you know, an, overall, um, an overall stock of capital assets that's sufficient mm -hmm. to sustain, to achieve a certain level of well-being, or is there more structure in that? Um, you know, that is where the debate is, I think. And so I'm, on, a, on a good day, I think I'm a, I'm a I'm personally an advocate of market-based discounting, but I'm, I'm not sure that discounting solves the intergenerational justice problems. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I, can I just, market-based discounting, uh, yes, but the prices have to be right. Mm -hmm. yes, At the moment, absolutely. there is no, no cost paid for greenhouse gas emissions. So whatever the market rate of return is at the moment, it's distorted by that fact that people are, are that. freely able to emit stuff. So that, that at any rate we have to do, we have to get the prices right. All right, I would totally agree with that. And I, I, I would have a, a weak sustainability rule or some kind of sustainability rule, um, which I see, um, and that's kind of where Solo goes. Solo argues that we should allocate resources efficiently and we should make sure that we're allocating enough total capital. And if, but then the question is, well, if we're depleting natural capital, how sure are we that we actually understand what it's worth and that we're making an adequate investment to replace its services, right? Right. So, so uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a philosopher, so I'm going, I'm going to only just summarize what the, the, some of the underlying assumptions here from an economic efficiency argument is that, uh, you know, one assumption, of course, is that we haven't, we haven't at all talked about technologies, and technology is also changing over time. We don't know what technologies will be available in the future, or there's some uncertainty related, related to that. We can maybe club all of those issues into the uncertainty argument. Mm -hmm. The second is about value, and how we value natural capital or any other form of capital. Um, in, the, in any, or to the extent that I am aware of valuation and the way economists are able to get as close as possible to a value on natural resources. It is fundamentally based on a starting point that preferences do not change. Right? We are, we are coming up with values based on how we observe people make decisions or what kind of scarcity value we might uh, we might attribute to a shadow price for you know fish in the ocean or or groundwater what what have you, um, but that does require technology preferences or tastes or something in which we can say how are people making those trade offs today and we're using trade offs that people make today as a way to project forward. That is the only way we are making any form of saying this is how we place a value on natural resources. And then those are the values that we're discounting or not discounting and moving on. Mm -hmm. Now that 
is, has no bearing if we say that what people care about may be very different from the trade-offs they make today. And can we? We have to make decisions, so there is a practical policy requirement, and this is the, this is the only way that economists are able to say anything about what we do, but does that mean that we cannot actually say anything at all about what the future may or may not value? I mean, everything that we do with valuation, and that is what I do for a living, but there is an underlying value judgment that we're making, which is people in the way they are transacting in the market today is enough or is the basis by which we're saying we value natural capital, human capital, any other form of capital. I agree. I think that's exactly right, that the valuations are given by or taken to be given by people's current preferences. You, I'm not sure that economists can't do better than that. I mean, you said this is the only basis that they could possibly use. But economists are clever people. Um, they should be able to make some predictions uh, sure. uh, about these things. You know, they can take account of people's psychology and make some assessments, which they need to do if they to make their future judgments. Correctly, I mean, I don't think we can, we should think that economics is stuck with whatever its current methods happen to be. It can do better, but I do do want to say one thing, which is that there are other values, or there may be other values. A lot of people think there are other values, which are simply not capturable by methods of economics as it's remotely like what we've got. These are these are say value of nature for its own sake. How about um, the value of the pain and suffering that's brought to animals as a result of climate change? Can economists take account of that? Well, some of them think they can, but what they actually take account of is what human beings think, what, what, human, what pe human beings are willing to pay for avoiding pain in animals, yeah. uh, pain and suffering to other animals. And this is a sort of be benefit coming to the people rather than to the uh, rather than suffering coming to the animals mm -hmm. so i don't think that their methods are able to do um to take account of values that are not ultimately values to the people sometimes they think they claim they can do it i think they're incorrect about that and i'm not sure how the method could be extended to do it mm -hmm. these things are not commensurate with the goods that that we enjoy, so they they can't be put on a single scale with human well-being, if you can measure that by monetary terms. No, so I think that is something that they won't be able to deal with. I I completely agree with you. I mean, I don't think I don't think economists um, think that they can uh, they can value uh, anything that is not through the lens of how humans perceive that value. I mean, I don't I don't. I don't know that we're trying to do that. Well, um, economists do talk about existence value. So they say that they can attach an existence value, say, to the existence of a mountain. And the idea is you ask people, well, first of all, you exclude the people who are getting ben benefits themselves from the mountain by having fun climbing up it or whatever. You find people who have no contact with the mountain, don't have any particular personal interest in using the mountain, and ask them, how much would you be willing to pay to keep the mountain? All good so far, I think. You know, this is a way of eliciting what value they attach to the mountain. It's a way of eliciting their judgment about the true value of the mountain. But then they add these values up across people. And that seems to me to make no sense, unless you think that in some way, it's actually the values to the people which you're eliciting. Why would you add up values across people if it wasn't the values to the people that, that, that um, are being added up? Yeah, that's, so that's, it's some way or other, it is they're treating it as though it's a value to the person. Yeah, no, that's one of, that's one of Mark Sagoff's critiques of, of contingent valuation. And I don't agree with all of his critiques, but I mean, that's an interesting one. He says that it's a, it's a category error to treat to treat these kinds of values as if they were efficiency values or human utility values, right? Yeah. Um, we can ask, though, about are, are people committed to act on values that are non-anthropocentric? 
and and that action does is going to involve giving up you know consumption and giving up material goods in some cases and then it, that pits what we understand as our own interests against our our commitment to a value that we we or some of us would interpret as not anthropocentric yeah and that's only one critique of of contingent valuation there are many others oh, yeah. that, that <laughs> Do, uh, does anyone have uh, any questions? We have a couple of minutes left. All right, so I, I, to conclude, maybe if we could just go around the circle again, starting with John. Um, I think I, I really, really appreciated this conversation. I think it showed uh, a, lot of, a lot of the complexities of climate economics and long-term valuation. Uh, you know, other, other sorts of environmental problems you know, face these similar questions as well. Um, weighing up the costs and benefits of them. So maybe if you could just, I could just ask you to all just make a, con a concluding thought about what is the place then of, of something like cost benefit analysis or economics um, in, pol in the, what role should it play in, in policy making um, uh, going forward, hoping, hoping that we are able to start again making some climate policies. I, I think I've already said that um, we face a problem which does involve some weighing up of some goods and some bads. Um, so I don't think that the balancing of costs against benefits can be avoided. It has to be done somehow. So the question is, how can we do it well? And I think that for the com complex problems that we face with climate change, the methods of economics do provide a sort of starter. Economists are good at handling very complex situations, at dealing with the situation of vast numbers of people over long stretches of time. This is something that economists, economics can do. So it can make use of the methods, but the important thing is to make sure that the methods are being used properly, which means they've got to be properly founded on proper ethical uh, basis. So my prescription is we use the methods of economics, but we apply severe critique to the ethical foundations of those methods and try and get them improved. We won't do this perfectly, but we've got to do the best we can. Great. Thank you. Richard? Yeah, Final I mean, I, I think I agree with that, although I'd, I'd say it differently, or maybe this is just a different view. I mean, it, it strikes me that we can justify a low discount rate either by adopting um, a utilitarian framing, as John is arguing for, or as Nicholas Stern applied back in 2006, or we can get to the same 1% discount rate if we take risk seriously and we think that we're investing in precaution. And so I, I, think it, I think that given that the ethical issues are in some sense, there simply are different framings and different points of view, it makes sense to do the analysis um, looking at it from different ethical lenses. And what we see here actually is that sort of regardless of which lens we choose, if we take the future seriously, then we get to a common answer, and that is that we have some obligation to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to stabilize climate, I think. Um, and, and it's really only if we, if, we, if, if we assume that it's only efficiency that matters and that we're gonna use a high discount rate, that then we, get a, then we get to this answer that maybe we should defer action until the long run future. And then I think that, that's, a, that's a deficient argument morally because it means that in exchange for small benefits accruing to the present generation, we think that it's okay to inflict much greater harms on future generations. Great, thank you, Sakya. And I, um, I, I agree with that too. And I, I think the only thing I would add here is that uh, the rather than think about only think about this only from a cost benefit and uh, from a standpoint of being able to project benefits or costs over very long time periods. Uh, given the uncertainty, there might be a way to really, you know, building on what Richard just said, uh, to think about risk and insurance and investments in natural capital as an insurance policy 
um, right. where it's an insurance policy for the present generation and yeah. for future generations. It is not, it's not, and that is something that economics can handle quite well uh, yeah. as a starting point, not to, you know, not, not dismissing any of the critique that we just heard, but, uh, but to say that, that is, it is, it is a, a starting point to think about investments in natural capital and to try and do a better job of pricing uh, natural capital. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, uh, let's let's thank our speakers for a really, really fascinating discussion. Thank you. <laughs>